So please give a warm Shmukon welcome to Katie. Thank you so much. I'm glad no one was injured in the start of the talk, so let's try to keep that moving. So I'm Katie. I'm going to be talking to you today about threat modeling and a practical approach to doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Who am I? I'm Katie. I have been working at a company called Red Canary for almost a month now. So I figured, like, why not give a talk as a company? It's fine. Um, so I do Intel at Red Canary. I think about, like, bringing together context, a bunch of data. That's what I like on the Intel side. Before Red Canary, I worked at a company called MITRE. Uh, I think, like, half the audience is MITRE. So thank you for supporting me, even though I don't work there anymore. I still love you all. I was on a um, team called Attack um, as their threat Intel lead. So I love doing that as well. Just different, different role now, different company. Um, I can be boiled down to three Cs, much like Dwight Schrute is a Bears Beats and Battlestar Galactica. I care about chocolate, CrossFit, and cyber threat intelligence. So that's really all you need to know about me. I was trying to figure out a good hook, like something interesting that would pique people's interest at ShmooCon and kind of synthesize how we feel sometimes when we're doing cybersecurity. And I finally settled on that catchphrase, resistance is futile. So um, my husband actually corrected me. I originally had a Voyager image, but I'm much more of a Star Trek fan of Next Generation, so he corrected me. And luckily, I had that uh, Trekkie consultant. So thank you to my husband if he's listening on Twitch. We sometimes feel like resistance is futile. That's that Borg catchphrase that they use, like, you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. And I don't know about you, but I've been doing this for over 10 years, and sometimes I feel like that. There are so many freaking threats out there. There are so many things to worry about, and I get overwhelmed. And I'm sure all of you have felt this way sometimes, too. So the good news is, resistance can seem futile, but it really isn't. And so today, I want to talk about how we can start to break through a lot of the noise that we have around different threats that we face. And a way to do that is with threat modeling. It's a really simple concept we're going to dive into, a way for us to try to trek through all of those different threats that we're facing, focus on the ones that matter as a way to get rid of the noise and kind of fight back against the adversaries. I'd be a jerk if I didn't acknowledge the amazing research that so many others have done on threat modeling. Um, Adam Shostak, this book, if you're interested in this topic, this book is amazing. It goes over everything you could ever want to know about threat modeling. Um, the stride model is a really common way in threat modeling people break down what are the different threats we could face, whether it's spoofing identity, repudiation, information disclosure. We talk about threat modeling, there are a lot of abbreviations. We have to abbreviate everything. Octave, Linden, a lot of different threat modeling approaches. And as someone with a threat intel background, what I found when I started looking into threat modeling was that it was often something that people developing software did. All right, we're writing code. We want to figure out what are all of the possible threats that could affect this code, and let's secure it. That's awesome. But I've found that too often threat modeling is something that software developers do or risk management folks do. And in many organizations, that's separate from the people who see the day-to-day -day threats, who have eyes on networks. So one thing that I feel passionately about is those communities coming together. Whether you're developing software securely, doing risk management, talk to the people who do threat analysis, who do network defense, those people in your security operations center. Those shouldn't be separate communities. They should be together. And so that's one thing that I started researching threat modeling. Traditionally, it's from that software development perspective, looking at all of the possible threats. Another really common threat modeling approach called POSTA, seven steps to find your objectives, your technical scope, application decomposition, you do your threat analysis, vulnerability weakness analysis, you do attack modeling, you do risk and impact analysis. Yeah, that's a lot to do. What, like, like it's hard? And yes, I did just incorporate a legally blonde meme in the same presentation as a Star Trek reference. It can be done, and it's gonna be okay, guys. It's a lot, and when I found, I looked at these traditional threat modeling approaches, and I was like, I would probably need a team of like 20 people in a few months to do that. I'm kind of lazy, so if only there were these magical people who knew something about threats, who could start to prioritize, narrow things down to the ones we care about, and magically there are. Cyber threat intel analysts, that's their job, is to figure out the threats that impact your organization, your team. And so whether you're a threat analyst, or you're a defender, or Maybe you don't do any of that. You can incorporate what I'm going to talk about today to create your own personal threat model. There's a lot of research, and I'm not saying that what I'm talking about is new or different. It's just a distilled way, an easy way to get started 
if you're sort of overwhelmed with all of these amazing things you can do with threat modeling. The way I define threat modeling is pretty simply. We have us. We have our organization, our assets, our people, the things that we care about protecting. And we have them, our threats, our adversaries, the things coming after us. And yes, there are two circles. We have to bring them together. I think about threat modeling as the intersection of us and them. Looking at what are the things our threats are likely to affect in our environments, and then trying to figure out how do we take that knowledge to drive better decision making, making in our organizations. So if you get nothing else, threat modeling, us and them, bring it together. That's how I define it. And I like to throw in this threat intel perspective because again, it's hard to focus on all of the threats. So let's prioritize. So I'm gonna propose a simple process. And again, if you read Adam Shostak's Stack's book, look into these other methodologies, this could synergize. Oh God, please don't throw anything. That could be very similar to that. It's just a distilled version. <laughs> really, no one threw anything for synergize? Come on, guys, come on. Drink, I don't have a, I don't have a Smirnoff ice, I'm really sorry, but that's okay. Oh, please don't. Oh God, Moose, really? I do not like whiskey, but thanks, thanks, Moose. It's not warm Smirnoff ice, so that's good. All right, I drank for my, for my Synergize. So, simple process to get started with threat modeling. We talk about us and them. Know your organization, the us. Know your threats, the adversaries, them. Then start to prioritize, match up the us and them. Take action on it. We're not just threat modeling to make something pretty for ourselves. Make, take action in your organizations. First one, go talk to people. I know, I know it's really scary, but this is the best way to find out about your organization. If there's someone like a sysadmin who's been there for, what, 20 years, go find that person, because they will know the deep, dark secrets of your networks. Network maps can be a really great place to start, but I think every organization I've ever talked to, um, they're, they're probably wrong. If anyone has an accurate one, hats off. Like, I will buy you a drink later, Moose will buy you whiskey, that's amazing. They're usually, yeah, you will, you will. For, for an accurate network map, she absolutely will because it's so rare. Networks are constantly changing. But it can be a good place to start. What are the key assets, the segments of our networks? Getting to know what we care about. Another recommendation I like to make is imagine the worst thing that could happen to your organization or your team. Like what would wake up and just ruin your entire day? Maybe you're a retailer. All right, your website goes down on Black Friday. You lose a ton of money in sales. That would be pretty bad. Financial, maybe your consumers, they can't trust their account balance. Like, that would really be bad. So thinking about what are the worst things that could happen in our organization, what are the assets that are really, really important, realizing maybe you can't map out everything, so focusing on the key things that are most important for you to protect. So I'm gonna be walking through threat modeling using mind mapping. I love mind mapping, it's a great way to get your ideas out there, so maybe you start really simply. In our fake organization, we're a retailer, we have user endpoints. Androids and Windows, web server that hosts our website, we care about that, and point of sale systems where those financial transactions happen. So starting out with the us, all right, these are the key things our organization cares about, starting simply. Next, know your threats, know the them. Some ways to go about this, looking at past activity in your networks. Again, those incident responders, those admins who've been there forever, talking to them, what have we seen previously? Past behavior from adversaries is not necessarily indicative of future behavior, but if you have nothing else, it's a pretty darn good place to start. There is so much out there in open source. Um, I have an RSS feed through Feedly, but there are many ways you can start to curate this amazing uh, InfoSec community on Twitter. If you follow amazing people who curate that content for you, uh, you can get a lot of knowledge about what's happening with threats in our environment or what might affect us. And um, if you don't have an RSS feed, maybe you want to start looking at this stuff, I have a link in the references to a blog post I wrote that has the references, the companies, and blogs that I follow um, when I'm trying to track new things happening in threat intelligence. Another key one, again, with the talking to people, talk to your peers. Whenever I go into a new, org new organization or talk to someone new, I say, well, all right, talk to you know, another bank if you're a bank, another retailer if you're a retailer, because they're probably gonna face similar threats as you. And one thing that I love about this community is you'd think like people who compete for money, retail dollars, they would never share. Yeah, they do. There are awesome people in this community that if you just reach out, meet them at a con over a beer or a tea, 
your LaCroix of choice, for example. Talk to people and they're willing to share if you reach out, whether it's via Slack, via an email distro, at a con like this. Get to know those people and then share information about the threats you're facing, because it's a really great way that you can send a short circuit all the work. If someone else is facing the same threats as you, use your peers in this community. All right, so let's say we do that notionally. We have a week to do this, so real quick, we talk to our organization. In the red, we find out we saw some APT1 targeting years ago. We've been targeted by Emotet and Ryuk, ransomware. Also, we've seen some Fin7 activity. We're a retailer, so we've seen them, some Fin digestion. In the orange, we see the threats that our industry cares about. So we haven't seen Cobalt Group or TA505, two different groups, but others in our industry have. So maybe that's something we should care about. In the yellow, all right, we read our RSS feed this week. Uh, Unit 42 did a great blog post on the X Hunt campaign, so we're going to think maybe we care about that. Schleyer, we read that's all over Max everywhere, so let's think about that. And APT32, we saw a sweet tweet from Chris Glyer about web bugs. APT32, maybe we should care about that. In reality, this would probably be huge, but you know, we're giving you a short circuit version. Start somewhere with a few things, a few threats that you might care about. All right, so we have the us and the them. Then we have to match those up and start to prioritize. It's tough as you do this, especially if you're a perfectionist. You're not going to be perfect the first, the second, even the third time you do this. But you have to start somewhere, matching up, prioritizing the threats that are likely to affect you. Again, thinking about what's affecting your industry, that's a great place to start, and the assets that you have. As we'll see in our example, not all threats are going to affect you, which is sort of the key of threat modeling. All right, let's start by our prioritizing our threats. So we went through, we looked at what has affected us in the past. APT1, like, it's kind of been a while since anyone has seen them, so let's not worry about them right now. Not to say we never need to worry about them ever, but for now, let's start somewhere else. They're not the highest priority for us. X Hunt, we look at who they've targeted. It's Middle Eastern organizations. Maybe not a huge priority for us. And APT32, they haven't targeted our, our organization, maybe, and, or our industry, our peers, so we're not going to worry about them right now. Again, not to say we never have to, but we've got to start somewhere. Now let's match up the us and the them. Our organization on top, and let's match with the threats that we've prioritized. So let's start out. Emotet's affected Windows quite a bit. Group TA505, definitely gone after Windows. A Cobalt Group, financially motivated organization, they've gone after point of sale systems and Windows too. Everyone loves Windows. Fin7's also gone after Windows and POS systems. Ryuk, same thing, a lot of Windows targeting there. Oof, Windows we gotta worry about. Then we get to Schlayer. Like, it targets Macs, we have Androids and Windows. So for now, let's not worry about Schlayer maybe until we get Macs. Starting to prioritize and make these connections from what we have in our organization to our adversaries and threats. From there, we need to take some kind of action. And again, thinking about what threats have done in the past is a great way to start. Not necessarily what they'll do in the future, but you can start to look at historical reporting, whether it's from you, from your friends, from your peers, from open or closed sources. Look at what others have done in the past, these adversaries and threats you care about, and start to build out that model. For each of those connections, for example, Fin7, they target Windows, Start to think about how have they targeted Windows. What tools, malware, tactics, techniques, and procedures, what TTPs have they used to try to come after Windows? And from there, make recommendations to improve your defenses. This is a single bullet point, and that's really, really hard to do. That's a whole separate talk on how to do this. Um, but luckily, before I left MITRE, uh, my former teammate Adam and I released an awesome training on attack and CTI. And Adam did a really great module in there that talks all about how do you take knowledge of adversary techniques and make recommendations to try to improve defenses in your organization. So I have a link to that. Um, great work from Adam. Lo referencing a lot of Adams. Adam Showstack, Adam Pennington. Um, that's a tough thing. But it's really important because, again, this threat model is not just a pretty thing to hang on the wall. It's not just meant to be like, oh, cool, we did this research, and here's what's like, like to target us. So what? I often see this problem in threat intel teams as well. It's sort of the, we've done intel, and this is what we care about, but you have to make that actionable. Make recommendations to your defenders. 
So start to do that for each one of those connections, each one of those dotted lines, Fin7, Cobalt Group, um, Amotet. What have they done in the past? What techniques or IOCs could we start to use to try to find them or prevent them from even getting it in the first place? Maybe that's a lot still. So this is using an open source tool called Attack Navigator, um, bringing up the different techniques just based on open source reporting that the team at MITRE mapped. But these are the techniques we've seen in open source reporting for the group called Fin7, mapped out, pretty visual, teal's my favorite color, so they're teal. And start to bring together the different techniques from those different groups. Because maybe you've prioritized even five threats, but that's still a lot to worry about. A lot of things they've done. So start to prioritize and create a heat map. So because everything is expressed in the same common format of attack, that knowledge base of different behaviors, we can overlay it. So Fin7 we care about from our previous steps. Cobalt group, let's look at the techniques they've used. Same thing, let's map those out. TA505, another group that we care about. And your powers have combined. This is Captain Attack. You can start to overlay those and create a heat map. So we have in yellow the techniques that one group's used, orange, two groups have, and red, techniques that those three groups that we figured out are probably going to affect us based on our research of threats in our own organization. Those are the techniques maybe we start with. From there, this is where sort of this talk ends and other talks begin. We start to take those red techniques and say, okay, spear phishing attachment, yeah. A lot of adversaries use that, so that's a pretty good place to start we're trying to figure out how to defend and mitigate. Maybe you make a simple recommendation like, hey, if we have limited dollars but we're looking to buy something, email gateways. That could be a pretty cool recommendation you could make. Maybe other recommendations like, we need to get email logs so our defenders can look at them. A lot of approaches you could take based on the knowledge that the threats you care about are doing certain things, so you need to focus your defenses there. From there, always repeat. Lather, rinse, and repeat. You're not gonna be perfect when you start out, and you don't have to be. Because the point here is just to focus on the threats that are likely to affect your organization. And we're never going to be able to get all threats. It's just not true. It's not possible. So you have to iterate and improve over time. There are constantly new threats coming up. Your organization is constantly changing, adding new things. So starting somewhere, though, don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough as you're doing threat modeling. Tying it back to Star Trek, that's where I started. You know, resistance seeming futile. I, I consulted my uh, Trekkie husband, and I was like, you know, I need a good image of the power of resisting the Borg. And he said, well, obviously, Hugh. So Trekkies will know that Hugh was an individual Borg, which, yeah, individual concept, I know, we'll just go with it. He was an individual Borg who came onto the Enterprise, got to know the crew, and figured out that, wow, like, everyone doesn't want to be assimilated by the Borg. And so what happened is he actually went back and planted a virus that took down the Borg for a little while um, until Data's brother got involved, but that's another talk as well. <laughs> but the point here, he was a single Borg. He was an individual, and he took down the rest of the Borg for a while. Even if you're an individual, you're one person, you can kind of cut through this feeling of being futile, that our resistance to our adversaries is futile. It's not you're gonna be overwhelmed. There's a lot to do in cybersecurity, whether you're a threat analyst, you're a SOC person, you're trying to secure software, develop it securely. There's a lot to focus on, but remember, it's not futile. We're in this together, and even as an individual, you can start small and use threat modeling to start to prioritize what you defend against. Takeaways for you, there's a lot of amazing research out there about threat modeling, so it can be really complex, but can also be simple. Whether you're a single person in an organization on a security team, whether you have a huge SOC, you can use threat modeling to start to prioritize the threats you care about and adding in that threat intel perspective of what are the adversaries that we've seen before or are likely to see can help you cut down from all of the threats in the world to the ones we really care about. And the key here, again, doing this threat modeling helps drive better outcomes in our organizations. That's what it's all about. So I think I am right at time. Um, of course, want to list all the amazing work from others who have done this. And so I'll be posting these slides um, on LinkedIn, on SlideShare. So I will tweet that out shortly after the talk if anyone wants the references. Um, mind map software, the training that I mentioned from Adam, RSS feed suggestions, all of those things for you as a take home.
with that, thank you all so much. If you don't subscribe to the Red Canary blog, we have a threat detection report coming out soon where we start to prioritize different adversary techniques. So you can follow me on Twitter if you have questions. I think we're at time, but I'll be around the rest of the day. So hit me up, and thank you all for listening. You should hang out for the next talk because it's also going to be awesome. Thanks. Have a good day.